Hi, everyone. I'm Pete Florence, and this is joint work with uh, Lucas Manueli and our advisor, Russ Tedrick. And this is our paper, Dense Object Nets, Learning Dense Visual Object Descriptors uh, by and for Robotic Manipulation. A very brief outline of the talk today. First, we're going to talk about a variety of related work, both in manipulation and in vision. And then we're going to talk about learning and using dense visual object descriptors for robotic manipulation. So when we think about robotic manipulation, at least one way to think about a hierarchy of tasks is an increasing complexity of the requests we might make of such a system. And at the top of this list, we might have something like the pick up anything task. And you know, the point of this task is to not do anything specific. It's just to pick up something in the clutter of objects in front of you. Um, and it turns out the grasping part of this is actually pretty hard, and there's been a lot of great work in the past few years in uh, addressing this problem. As we go farther down this list, we might want to do things like pick up a specific object, grasp a specific part of a specific object. And at the end of this list, what we would love to have is robots walking around the house uh, doing things like cleaning up the kitchen, making a sandwich. Uh, many of you might know this demo from Spot, uh, putting some dishes away. But there's at least one other axis we need to be thinking about here, and that's the generality of the approaches that we're using. So the method that I showed you earlier, that's actually a very general approach, and that's been proven out to work on a huge variety of objects. Um, the demo from Boston Dynamics, on the other hand, is an awesome demo, but we can't be sure if it only works for that exact kitchen and with those objects and those initial configurations. And so I think where we'd all like to be is in this bottom right corner of the plot, where we have systems that are both very general and can handle uh, very complex requests. And I think we can also all agree that whichever method you want to use, whether it's a ton of hand tuning, imitation, or reinforcement learning, there's certainly challenges in scaling to these tasks. And so let's take a look at one of these tasks, uh, the pick up a specific object task. And as a case study, let's think about the Amazon Robotics Challenge, because arguably in that challenge, this was the hardest part of the challenge. And there ended up being two key ingredients that most of the teams in the end kind of converged on using. On the one hand, some type of grasp success model that can go from raw sensor data to where in, for example, an image is a good place to grasp, and pairing that with something like instance segmentation. And clearly, if you want to grasp a specific object, it might get you about 90% of the way there to just look up the pixels of the object you care about and then pick the, grasp, the best grasp uh, for that object. And there's been a lot of work on both sides of this problem, and some of these works address um, both of the sides, on how to best grasp from raw sensor data. And on the instant segmentation time, side in the robotic domain, it's really about how do we scale uh, data collection for getting these types of representations. But if we think about what's been happening in computer vision, we've been addressing increasingly challenging problems with increasingly uh, good results, and to this level where you know, a system like MASCAR CNN produces very uh, powerful uh, uh, instant segmentation results. And this really, though, is, is where the Amazon Robotics Challenge stopped in terms of the types of visual representations that were used. There are other representations out there, though. And uh, in the bottom right, for example, this dense pose paper, this is an amazingly rich representation with these dense descriptors we basically have an identity of each pixel of this human, for example, playing soccer. And so if we think back to the robot manipulation tasks we'd like to address, and we want to go farther down this list in terms of the increasing complexity of the request, um, we had two rules for ourselves as, as we try to look at uh, going farther down this list. The first is we think that whatever we do has to work for deformable objects. I think there's just no if, and, or but about it. And then the second one would, would be nice, and that would be, it would be great if everything we can do is just self-supervised. And you could get around it with other ways, but that would certainly be great. And we were definitely inspired by this awesome paper from Tanner Schmidt, Richard Newcomb, and Dieter Fox, where they entirely self-supervised from RGBD, learned dense visual object descriptors, uh, for example, for uh, this is a human data set. And they can do things like take the image on the left, uh, and then do a dynamic reconstruction with dynamic fusion, and then using the visual object descriptors, transfer that dynamic fusion model to the scene on the right with a little bit of ransack. And this is like an awesome and amazing result. So moving on to thinking about dense descriptors in the context of robot manipulation. Before we go any farther, let's give a careful definition of 
what are dense descriptors? So in the bottom left image, this is our beloved caterpillar object. And we have a full resolution W by H by 3 image. And we want to map it to another full resolution image. But in this image, uh, each pixel has a d-dimensional descriptor. And you can choose d. Uh, and if we choose d equals 3 and we normalize the image, we can visualize this descriptor uh, image as just another color image. And the key thing is what we want to achieve is as we look at a certain point, so for example, if the caterpillar moves around, we want the color in the descriptor image of, for example, the ear to look the same from any viewpoint of the caterpillar. So how do we train these models? Um, we use a particular type of contrastive loss, and contrastive loss is very powerful and been applied to many challenging uh, domains, including uh, particularly in vision. But in particular, we use a pixel-wise variant of contrastive loss, which was developed by these other couple papers here. And there's two parts to pixel-wise contrastive loss. The first is taking a bunch of images where we know many, and we know many because we're doing dense reconstruction, uh, pixel-wise correspondences between one image on the left and one on the right. So that's the you know, right foot of the caterpillar, the pink one, and that corresponds to the point over in the other image. And what we want to do with these pixels that are matches is we want to push them to the same part of descriptor space. And similarly, for non-matches, we want to push um, those descriptors apart. Specifically, in, in this loss function, for example, we want them at least a margin m apart. And then the loss function is just the sum of these two parts. Now, in our domain, we have a robot. And one cool thing about a robot is it's not just a static computer vision data set, so we can um, move the arm around and move the camera around. So we have a 7 dof robot arm, and we have an RGBD sensor mounted on the end of the arm with a parallel jaw gripper. And what we can do is we can put, just put any object in front of the robot, and we can do a 3D reconstruction of that object by moving the camera around. And then since we've, we know what the background looks like, particularly in 3D, because we can just do a 3D reconstruction of that, then we can subtract out uh, the object from the scene. We can get very precise masks of the object in front of us. Now, to get this to work in practice with uh, pretty good precision, uh, we introduced three techniques that help a lot in increasing performance. So the first is, as I just talked about, masking the object out of the scene. It turns out this is just hugely helpful, and that's because a large part of your image is not the object that you care about. And what we want to do is we want to focus the models on the objects and not the background. The second thing, and this is possible because we've masked the objects from the background, is we want to domain randomize the background. And what we find is this really helps reduce overfitting, and particularly because it's possible to uh, minimize the loss function just by memorizing the background and then seeing where, uh, where the object is relative to the background. But if we domain randomize it, it reduces that. And thirdly, this is uh, just in the realm of something numerical that helps a lot. Uh, we find that many of the non-matches that we sample turn out to just evaluate to zero in the max function down there. They're already at least in margin m apart. So we just want to do some nice scaling. And what we do is scale by the number of hard negatives that we find. So most of the results I'm showing you today are qualitative, but to show at least one quantitative plot. What this is showing is basically an ablation study of the techniques I just mentioned. So we have, uh, this is our implementation and on our data uh, of the baseline training procedure that's in red. And then using all the techniques in the paper, we can get up to uh, the purple. And this is a CDF plot. And the point is to try and be as far up and to the left as possible. And so what does this look like? This is me uh, twirling our little caterpillar around. And as you can see, uh, in the descriptor images, we achieve a pretty good level of consistency image to image. And there's no temporal information that's used here. And the key point is that we've achieved uh, invariance to viewpoint, configuration, deformation, and lighting. And this runs at about 20 hertz with our model. So another way to visualize what we've learned, and this is actually really uh, pretty simple, we're just going to take the image on the far left and the image on the far right. We're going to send them to descriptor images. And then we're just going to do some nearest neighbor lookups. And what we're going to do is we're going to do this real time. So we're just going to hover over the image on the left. And on the right, we're showing the nearest neighbor looked up in descriptor space. And then in the middle, we're showing a heat map where the distances are in L2 in descriptor space, because that's how we've trained uh, this metric learning mapping. So that's great. We've learned something about that object. Um, now, what can we do with it? So this is one task. 
where we're going to click, and this is just one reference image, we can click on any part of the object. We'll click on the tail, for example. And once we've clicked on that tail, then we can store the descriptor associated with that tail, and we can identify and grasp that part of the object uh, in a variety of configurations, even if we deform the object, for example. Here's a slightly harder one, where we're going to click on the right ear of the caterpillar, and then we can identify the right ear of the caterpillar, even if it gets turned around, and in a variety of configurations. And, and that's one that people often get, uh, people often ask us about, can we handle symmetry? And that, it, that shows at least if there's enough visual texture, we can disambiguate symmetry. So that's great. We can do one object. We can sort of learn a visual model of it, but there's a lot of objects out in the world. And it turns out that if you train using those procedures on a few different objects, what we find is that you get overlap in descriptor space. And what that means is the descriptor for, for example, the toe of Baymax and the left ear of the caterpillar, they might map to the same point in descriptor space. And that's not really what we want. What we want is we want to have globally unique descriptors. And by introducing a, a few different uh, methods for sampling into the loss function, we show that we can achieve globally unique descriptors. And what that means, for example, is those two points are now in different parts of descriptor space. So that's great, too. Uh, with, with those methods, we can now separate uh, objects from each other and have globally unique descriptors. And so we can click on one point. That was the heel of that sort of red Nike. We can click on one point of one shoe. And then even in clutter, we can identify and then grasp that specific point of that specific shoe. So we can handle multiple objects, and we can push them apart in descriptor space. So that's great, too. But there's really a lot of objects out in the world, and we can't probably have our robots see every single object before we interact with them, and we can't scale to scanning in every single object in the world. And so one path forward that we think is really compelling is the idea of class-consistent descriptors. And so a question is, and this is somewhat similar to, as you saw in the prior work with the human data set, but if we do it with a bunch of different objects, can we train on these six hats, for example? And the key point is we have no supervision at all between any of the different instances of the hat. But if we train on all these instances simultaneously, can we achieve consistent descriptors across the class? And what we find is, for hats, for example, uh, we can achieve class-consistent descriptors. Some of these hats in this video were seen during training, and some were not. We can do this for shoes as well. Again, some were seen during training, and these last couple were not. And we can do it for mugs as well. So now we can get class-consistent descriptors, and what can we do with that in terms of manipulation tasks? Here's one where this is one of my shoes, and I'll click on the uh, top of the laces, the tongue of the shoe. And this is just in one reference image for one shoe. And then for a variety of instances of that class, we can identify and grasp that specific spot of that specific, or sorry, that specific spot, but on the entire class of shoes. And some of these shoes were seen during training time, and some were not. And now Lucas is taking off his shoe and checking on the table. <laughs> um, we were very happy with this demo. It was one of the first robot demos I've done where like, everything just worked the first time. So that was, that was pretty fun. <laughs> so um, let's take a step back here and think about um, what we're doing from sort of a high level. A variety of points um, to make. I think the key one, the first one, is that this works for any 3D reconstructable object. Um, and there's absolutely no prior knowledge that's needed. And we can talk about what objects are easily 3D reconstructable, but it, it really covers a huge range of objects. And I think even with simulation and things, uh, we could uh, also do things like glass. This is very sample efficient, and I mean that particularly in terms of the amount of time that's needed to interact with objects. So uh, those models were learnable in about five minutes of data per object and just 15 minutes of training. It's a pretty interpretable representation, and we think it's usable as input to a wide variety of systems. So whether that's uh, sort of a modular, traditional robotic manipulation pipeline, or you could take these descriptors and feed them into an end-to-end -end system, along with your original raw data, for example. Uh, it's useful for a wide variety of tasks, easy to measure success and failure on your own training data. And what we're sort of doing here and why we think it's so efficient is we're taking advantage of 
the structure of existing algorithms like calibration, 3D reconstruction, inverse kinematics, et cetera, and focus on learning one of what we think is the hard parts. Uh, all the code and data is open source, and with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. So we have time for a couple of questions. So you mentioned, ah, uh, oh, there. Yes. Uh, hello? that there, are, there aren't very like, quantitative results, and I was wondering if you have some way of evaluating how often it works, or for how many, like, what percentage of objects are able to be represented in this way? Great question. So I only showed one quantitative plot today. Uh, all the code's open source. We have this like, huge battery of, of quantitative plots that we make for, uh, for all the training that we do, and there's uh, like five different metrics we compute. We compute it both for either masking the object out of the scene or not. And then we both test on train data, test data, and then we also label only for tr uh, evaluation and not for training um, cross um, instance and cross um, uh, configuration, which we have no training data on. And so we, we can make plots about all those, and we do see performance just relative in terms of, of uh, the techniques I mentioned. But it's a great question. And I think we, we can't come up with any guarantees on when, for example, the key thing is finding consistency. And in practice, we found consistency emerges quite a lot, not always. For example, the, uh, we had two like, kind of anthropomorphic to uh, toys, and they didn't acquire uh, consistent descriptors, but they look quite different. Uh, but we have, we have no guarantees, but it does happen a lot, and it's easy to evaluate whether or not it's happened. Other questions? Hi, great talk. Um, I like the idea of the, uh, the dense descriptors. Um, do you see any way of uh, training this model without having explicit 3D rec reconstruction of an object? For example, using pairs of images of an object instead? So that's a good question. Uh, you could certainly train uh, something to identify, for example, just, just from pairs of images, uh, objects. But the key thing here is that this method is, is dense rather than just whole image based. So um, in order to acquire the pixel level correspondences, you could hand label them, for example, or come up with them from a variety of means. But the self-supervision and uh, you know, 3D vision is great. And that gives a, a huge amount of supervision. How do you handle the case of uh, very deformable objects like scissors, for example? So you want to pick up uh, like a closed scissor or an open one or a closed one? So good question. Um, for objects that are very deformable, uh, Kind of the most deformable one we showed was this caterpillar, and we never trained it when it was sort of bent like that, and we just we see consistency even in those pretty um, deformed configurations. But I do think for, for very deformable objects, maybe like a rope as another example, my guess would be that you can also acquire consistency, but you might want to have two things to help you. One is have lots of intermediate configurations, and then the other one is, like the prior work, you can also use dynamic, uh, so non-rigid reconstruction, and then you can acquire uh, training that way. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>